Oh, hello there. Welcome back to What's in the Bible's review of the Old Testament. We have a lot to cover today, so Chuck Wagon, can you start us out? Oh, the Philistines were big and mean and tall and strong and hairy. The toughest dudes you ever seen to Israel, they look scary. So they said to Samuel, here's the thing, it's time for us to have a king with crown and robe and fancy ring riding high upon the saddle. He'll lead us into battle. Clive, where'd the Philistines come from? Ian, this slide, please. Right down. Um, Ian, it's upside down. Sorry. Right. The Philistines were a group of people who arrived in Canaan from the sea around 1100 BC. Archaeologists today believe they came from the island of Crete. They were tough, aggressive and good at making weapons from iron, which was new at the time. They gave the Israelites lots of trouble. Couldn't God handle the Philistines? Of course he could. God promised to help Israel with all their enemies, if they would trust him and follow his directions. Which they did not. Not at all. Correct. They tried to fight the Philistines without God's help, and they got whooped. So instead of turning to God, they asked for a king? Yep. They thought they'd do better if they had someone big and impressive leading them into battle. More big and impressive than God? I know. Kind of crazy. Kind of nuts. So God gave them what they were asking for. He had Samuel pick a guy named Saul, who was really tall and really impressive. And he became Israel's king. So Samuel went and crowned a king, a feller name of Saul. His royal look was just the thing, and man, that guy was tall. His arms were strong, his hair was thick. He whooped the Philistines right quick. King Saul, they cried, is mighty slick. We're glad that he succeeded. A king is what we needed. Well, that doesn't sound so bad. Nope, that worked out pretty well. At first it did, but then they bumped into an issue. King Saul wasn't always good at doing what God asked him to do. Sometimes Samuel would tell him what God wanted him to do, and he would do the exact opposite. Saul was a big, strong, brave guy, but when it came to following God, he was a failure. Saul said, look at all the impressive things I've done, the battles I've won, all the sheep and cattle I've captured from our enemies. But Saul had forgotten that God doesn't want us to be impressive. He wants us to be obedient. He doesn't want to hear excuses. He wants us to listen to his voice and do what he says. Since Saul hadn't done that, the crown couldn't stay in his family. God was going to find a new king for Israel, a man who would do whatever God asked, no matter what. A man after God's own heart. Oh, Saul, 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 you sure look like a king. You're tall, tall, tall with the robe and the ring. But you'll fall, 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 cause you're missing one thing. You can't serve God halfway. To follow him, you've got to obey. So God chooses David to be Israel's next king. Chester, tell us about King David. Yes, David was a hero. King Saul was so impressed that he made David a leader in his army. And everything David did was a big success because of the spirit of the Lord was with him. But then King Saul noticed something. The people who used to cheer for him were now cheering for David. The women who used to sing songs about him were now singing songs about David. And Saul became jealous. He was filled with envy and a hatred. Yes, King Saul turned to the dark side. Wait, wait, what? Jester, that's the guy from those space movies. I know, but it's similar. He was big and strong. He was good, but he became jealous and filled with hate. He turned to evil. 
Okay, as long as the kids know that King Saul was a real person, not a make-believe guy from a movie. Well, now they do. And here comes a David. He's just a kid, but he's good. He's a brave. He can save the galaxy. I mean Israel from evil. And King Saul said, the spirit of God is very strong in this one. And young David said, I will fight you. Cut, cut. David didn't fight King Saul. He wouldn't. He wouldn't fight? Why, was he a chicken? No, he was very brave, but he knew that God had chosen King Saul just like God had chosen David. And David would not hurt someone that God had chosen. So he wouldn't fight him? Nope. But King Saul wanted to kill him. Right. So what did he do? The only thing he could do, he ran. Right, he took off a running and King Saul took off after him. Evil King Saul chased him through the deserts, through the mountains. David had to live in the caves and hide out in the wilderness. And as he ran, brave men started running with him. Sort of like when Forrest Gump is running and these people follow him around yelling, Run, Forrest, run! Except in this case it was, Run, David, run! And pretty soon he had his own little army running around out there. They even took time to save cities in Israel when they were attacked by other nations. All while running away from Saul, whom they could have killed pretty much any time, but they wouldn't because David respected God. What a guy! So, how does it end? Finally, after a few weeks of running... A few weeks? A few months? Um, eight years. At least. Holy cow, he must have been in a great shape. Anyway, after eight years of running, give or take, King Saul finally died. I think he had a heart attack from trying to keep up. Uh, no, it was the Philistines. What? Those guys again? I told you, they're like a flu bug. Yeah, we got that. The Philistines attacked Israel once more, and this time David wasn't there to save the day. King Saul and his son Jonathan died in the same battle. What happens next? Things went wonderfully for quite a while, but not forever. Uh-oh. What happened? More Philistines? No, it wasn't the Philistines. It was David himself. Things go downhill in the second half of 2 Samuel, all because of David's sin. Oh dear. What did he do? Well, David is older now. His army is out battling one of their enemies, and for some reason, David didn't go with them. He stayed home. So while his generals and soldiers are fighting, he's just sitting at home with nothing to do. That doesn't sound like David. No, it doesn't. While he was at home with nothing to do, he saw a beautiful woman named Bathsheba. Bathsheba was so beautiful that David wanted her to be his wife. And that's bad? He was bad because she was already married. She was somebody else's wife. Oh, that is bad. But David didn't care. He wanted her as his wife so much, he just took her. <gasps> what did her husband say? Sometimes to cover up the bad things we've done, we do things that are even worse. Bathsheba's husband was a man named Uriah, a faithful soldier in David's army. To cover up his sin, David told his general to put Uriah in a place in the battle where he was sure to be killed. Wait. He had Uriah killed. I'm speechless. Yep. First, David stole someone's wife. This is called adultery, and it's breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Then he had Bathsheba's husband killed. This is murder, breaking another one of the Ten Commandments. So David committed adultery and then committed murder to cover up the adultery. Yep. Was he thinking God wouldn't notice? If he was, that thought didn't last very long. God sent a prophet named Nathan to tell David that God knew exactly what he had done. And what did David do? Well, he didn't make excuses like Saul did when he sinned. David repented. What's repented? To repent means to change your mind and will, to turn away from wrongdoing and sin. Who becomes king after David? 
David and Bathsheba have another son who becomes a very famous king. His name is Solomon. Yep. After First and Second Samuel, we come to First and Second Kings, two books that talk about all the rest of Israel's kings. The first king they talk about is David's son, Solomon. Okay, the next king of Israel is Solomon. So, how'd he do? He started out great. He loved God and followed God's laws. Yep, so God showed up in a dream and told Solomon to ask him for anything he wanted. So what'd he ask for, a submarine? No, he didn't ask for a submarine. I bet he asked to be rich or famous. That's what most kings want. Yes, that is what most kings want, but that isn't what Solomon asked for. No, Solomon asked for wisdom. Wisdom? What's that? Wisdom to be wise, the ability to make good decisions. What? How boring is that? He could have asked for a brontosaurus with headlights. When you're a king, making decisions is everything. Good decisions will help your people. Bad decisions will hurt them. Solomon didn't want to be a rich king or a famous king. He wanted to be a good king. I bet God liked that request. He sure did. God said, since you asked for wisdom, not only will I make you a wise king, I'll also make you a rich and famous king. So he got it all. Except the brontosaurus with headlights. I don't think he wanted one of those, Ian. Probably because he didn't know they exist. Let's just let that go now. All right. It'd just be fun, that's all. As a king, Solomon was incredibly wise. He always knew what to do. And his good decisions made Israel very wealthy. They had tons of gold and silver and horses and chariots. Wow, Solomon was a great king. Yes, he was. Is this the place where it turns? What do you mean, Clive? Well, I've noticed in most of our stories that things start out great. God gives us a wonderful garden or a land filled with milk and honey or a kingdom and the power to win all our battles and then we ignore him and mess it all up. Now that you mention it, I've noticed that too. So does that happen to King Solomon too? Good observation, fellas. Well, all that wealth and all that fame can have an effect on a guy. King Solomon spent seven years building a house for God, then spent 13 years building an even bigger house for himself. That's a bad sign. He even built a big palace just for his favorite wife. Wait, favorite wife? He had more than one? It was common back then for kings to show how rich they were by having lots of wives. How many did he have? Two? More than that. Two and a half? You can't have half a wife. Two and three quarters? He has seven hundred. Seven hundred wives. <laughs> seven hundred? That's a lot of wives. Yep, way more than he needed. First Kings also says he had 40,000 stalls for his horses. Way more than he needed. And that was a problem because God's law specifically said that kings of Israel weren't supposed to collect more horses than they needed. Yet that's exactly what Solomon was doing. But it gets worse. Of course it does. Many of King Solomon's wives weren't from Israel. They didn't pray to the true God. So they asked King Solomon if they could build temples and make sacrifices to their own fake gods, to idols. Oh no, not this again. Same song, next verse. And wouldn't you know it, before long King Solomon was praying to the fake gods too. Apostasy! That means walking away from your beliefs. I learned it in the last show. It's a good word. You should use it as much as possible. Of course, sin has its consequences. And the consequence of King Solomon's sin was what happened next. What was it? What happened next? I can't bear to look. What happened next was... We're out of time. So what happens next is for our next show. <sighs> Not again. So, we learned about three kings, King Saul, King David, and King Solomon. 
They all made mistakes, but they handled them in very different ways. When King Saul disobeyed God, he made excuses. When King Solomon disobeyed God, he acted like nothing was wrong, like he was so important, so rich and so famous that he didn't have to pay attention to God. But when King David disobeyed God, he fell on his knees and he repented. He asked God to forgive him and to give him the strength to do better the next time. So as you grow up, you're going to make mistakes too. Which king do you want to be like? David! The kids were supposed to answer. Oh, sorry. Say David. Hey, Ann. Sorry. David. Only you can decide what you're going to do.